Today I'm going to be looking at ASTA, which is a multi-point software that runs on top of Windows. And what it lets you do is it take one computer like this computer here and have two users using it at the same time, each with their own screens, keyboards, mice, and other peripherals. And the idea behind this is, for a lot of uses, a standard desktop computer is way overkill. It has a lot more RAM and CPU power and GPU power than you'd ever need. So you could easily attach two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or maybe even more of some software users to one physical computer and still have enough horsepower left over. Now it will need more horsepower than a single user, but if you're doing things like web browsing or text editing, it should work fine. And to represent this use case, I have this system here connected to one screen here, a second monitor here, and two sets of keyboards and mice. Now using a program like Asta, which is built on kind of a multi-point idea where you have one OS with multiple users, isn't the only way to do it. Another common way to do it online, is to have virtual machines with hardware pass through such as graphics cards and USB devices. And this will make it so that each user has its own Windows 10 OS. And that Windows 10 OS will behave like it would on any other system. You can also run multiple OSs on it. But it brings a few disadvantages. First of all, the issue with that is it has hardware limitations. In order to run multiple VMs, you have to have a system with multiple graphics cards or a compatible graphics card. You have to have a system that can do IOMMU pass through correctly. You have to have a OS that supports it, so that's right now Windows Server, Linux, um, VMware ESXi, and a couple others. And there can also be a slightly more tricky software setup with some potential annoyances. So I'm gonna be looking at multi-point now. One issue is it is running on top of one OS, which can potentially have limitations. Um, compared to the Microsoft multi-point software, which was in Windows Server and I think has been discontinued as of 2019, um, it is kind of like a hack job where it's not intended to support it. So there can be potential issues, and some software that I've used in the past is just not happy running on a multi-user environment in Windows. It just doesn't want to have multiple instances running. For today's test setup, I'm going to be using a kind of a bit of an older gaming PC as a representative test. So I have an AMD FX8350, an RX480, and a 2 terabyte SSD, and 8 gigs of RAM. While this is far from the fastest you can get these days, it should be able to provide multiple users with kind of lightweight experience, so maybe even run a couple lighter games at the same time, maybe like League of Legends or Team Fortress 2. Software-wise, I currently have a fully up-to-date copy of Windows 10 running on this system. And it detects my two monitors and keyboards and mice, and they both work at the same time. So if I move both mice right now, they can both move the same cursor. And if you type on both of them, they will type in the same location. That's not how I want it to work with multiple users. And also, the screens are currently extended, so I can drag stuff between monitors. So now I'm taking a look at the website for the software. So it is not free software, but they do have a free trial you can use it with. They show um, single setups. And if we take a look at pricing, we can see there's a couple different licenses available for a two user, a six user, and you can buy additional users up to 12. Looking at licensing pricing, a two-user home license, which I believe only lasts for one year according to their website, is $18, whereas a six-user is $100. So it's definitely not free software, but compared to at a price of another computer, it is cheaper. So it could easily turn into a cheaper solution, especially if you're at a situation where you have a lot of users who don't need a lot of resources. Now, I've already downloaded the installer on the system, and we're going to go through the installation process. So. It's going to go and open, it's going to ask for administrative permissions, and it's going to just go through asking your language, if you want to make a restore point, which basically means you can go back in time if it and screw something up during the installation. It says, like, what the license agreements are, and you give it a little second, and it will install its software, and now that it's said, it will um, say it's going to reboot the system, and then it's ready to use. So it already said one thing about it, which it had issues of GeForce experience. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later, but a lot of software in Windows does not behave well if there's multiple people using the same OS at the same time. Now that Aster is installed, I can see an icon on the desktop. To use it, I'm going to double click it, and after a couple seconds, it's going to say it needs administrator rights to set something up. I'm going to say yes and let it do it. And it's going to say, here's your install ID, so this is helpful for licensing. I'm just going to run the trial version, so that should be recorded. And now it's going to say, hey, I'm going to be running in trial mode. 
So I'm going to say I don't have an activation, I want to use a trial for 30 days, make sure it works right. So now I'm going to restart the program, and in a couple of seconds now, it should be ready to go. So, as I can see here, it doesn't seem to be doing display scaling right, but once we go, we can enable Aster and set it up. But first of all, we're going to set up workplaces. So, as we can see now, everything's put onto place one. So I have my two monitors on the other display as well here. I have my two keyboards and my two mice. And the nice thing it gives you here is it lets you move it and it'll show you which one's lit up by the little blue square or type on a keyboard and that keyboard will lay, turn on. So now I want to go assign my thing, devices. So if I move my mouse, I can see that this mouse here is lit up blue. The other mouse is not lit up and is this other mouse. So I want to move it. So I'm going to right click on the other mouse and I'm going to click workplace appointment. I'm going to say two. Okay. And then I'm going to type on my other keyboard, this Dell keyboard. I can see it's this left one here. So I'm going to say move this to two. Okay. And then displays. So I can see um, which display it is. So this one says like the Dell monitor. And I know I have a Dell monitor here and an Asus monitor here. So I want the Asus to be part of two. So that looks like a good setup. So I can see I have a keyboard. So now looking at each workplace, I have a keyboard, monitor, and mouse attached to each of them. Compared to other workplace, this manual one can be kind of annoying, especially if you had a lot of systems. But another way they can do it is if you look at your USB tree, you can see how it's set up with hubs. I've also seen ones that use it so that you have to always have a um, USB hub connected to every device. And I'd say this should only need to be run once. It's pretty good. We're going to enable now place two. But in order to do that, we have to do a restart. And that's going to change a lot of stuff. And it's going to need to run something else's admin rights. And after a little bit, you're going to have to um, do this. And it's going to say we're going to need to do a quick little reboot. So after a reboot, stuff looks a little bit deeper. It's not extended anymore. And I have two different lock screens. So I can go lift up each of these separately. So I'm going to go now log into my main system. And once it finishes logging in, I can go log into my secondary system. So on this system, I'm going to just use my other account, user1. So this system here is connected to a domain. So that means I can connect to all my test accounts like user1 that I've made earlier. If you don't have a domain, you either have to log into the same account on all your systems, or you're going to need to um, add another account to the system, which can be done just using Windows utilities. So now I'm going to start playing around. This feels like a kind of normal system. If I look under display settings, I can see it has one display. If I maximize it, it works well. I can do things like change resolution, layout, everything. Uh, looking at the hardware, this seems kind of like a normal computer. Another issue is audio. So for a lot of uses like playing YouTube, you'll want to have audio on each device. So with this system, by default, it'll just pump it from the default audio to from everyone to every user. And this can get kind of annoying. So what you can also do is if you look under shares, you can see all your devices. So you can see a lot of different USB devices that aren't normally used. So if we take a closer look at some of these, we can see like the USB hubs, there are different microphones. I'm going to see a lot of speakers here because my graphics card can technically support up to six monitors with speakers. But I assigned a speaker to each system now. So now that it, if I hit apply, it'll make it so that this system here, if I play the ad, comes out of this speaker. But this system here will only come out of these headphones I have, which is exactly what you'd want. So you can go attach more like USB audio, or if your sound card supports it, or if you use a display like this that has a built-in audio or headphone output, you can just give everyone a display with output. So that's working pretty well. Looking more at the app, it's pretty simple. There's not too many extended settings. The extended settings is a lot of stuff like only letting you use certain um, programs and letting you use certain IP addresses for those programs. But other than that, there's not too much to see. It's pretty simple, it works pretty well, and you get programs. Now let's talk about things that don't work. So if I've shown, you can have it so two people can watch YouTube on each system, and that works fine. And other browsers like Chrome work without an issue. Now, an issue I've had was Steam. Steam does not let you have more than one user on a single computer at once. You can have it so both people have it installed, both people can log in, but the moment another person uses it, it'll kill it on the other person who has it running session. Unfortunately, that ruins a lot of game testing I like to do. 
But we're going to install Steam and try using it anyways and see how it works. See if there's any weird performance issues or stuff like that. I'm going to take a closer look at gaming. So gaming is a relatively common workload where you kind of want a friend to come over and play a game on an, in your system. And if you don't have another system or want to get one, this could be a cheap way to do it. So let's go play around with some common use cases. So um, one issue I've discovered is Steam does not like to run on multiple instances on one system. So as you just saw, Steam closed on my second user and now it's firing up on this user now and it switches. And to prove it's not a fluke, if I open Steam on this other user, it's going to kill it on this user and open it there. On the other hand, the Epic Games launcher doesn't have a problem running at the same time on both systems. So you have to take this into account. I don't have every game that I can test, but it seems to be a some work, some don't. Now, one thing about it is if you have games going, you want to make sure they perform well. So let's go test how well it works running two games at once on here. So on this system, I have Amnesia The Dark Descent. It's an older horror game, but it should run reasonably well. So if I just hit launch game on this system, it's going to fire it up on this screen, change the screen resolution, and start getting the game launching. Now if I go switch to Steam on here, I can go fire up a game like Team Fortress 2. Both of these games are relatively low in terms of graphical requirements, especially at these lower settings I'm using them at, so it should have enough power in my RX 480 to run both of them. But it's can it split the GPU power without having weird issues? So, I had a weird crash here with Amnesia The Dark Descent. I don't know if it was just an issue with that game and this setup. I don't know if it was just a, a random crash or something. But I do have it working with Slime Rancher on this system here. And TF2 is loading and is working fine as well. Um, performances, this is 4K. Looks kind of like medium, tried to make a guess. Runs fine, but it's a very easy to run game. Um, TF2 also runs fine, but it is a, another very easy to use game. So this shows it seems to be splitting graphical performance reasonably well. So it's not perfect, but it's definitely splitting time between applications and it doesn't have any abnormal stutters or anything like that. But as I showed before, there is definitely issues that happen and they appear to be kind of random and just programs aren't happy, it seems like. Another thing I'm going to look into is breaking it, as I kind of like to say. So as a normal user, which this system is logged in as a non-administrator, normal user, can I easily break it? Can I disrupt the experience of everyone else? So the Aster app itself requires administrator access for a lot of functions. And most functions you'd be doing. So if you want to change the layout or anything like that, you're going to need administrator access. So I'm going to just try opening Aster on this instance. And it's going to open, but it's going to say, hey, if you want to change anything, you're going to need admin access. So, like, maybe I don't like this person, or well, I want to go change the workplaces. So I can go tell it to, um, like, workplace assignments. I'm going to just assign this mouse to nothing. I'm going to hit apply. And it's going to ask me for an administrator username and password, and I'm going to tell it no. And it's going to say there's a problem. Um, while there doesn't appear to be any way to easily keep this user from opening it, you can do those sorts of things through group policy and stuff, it's just not provided via Aster. Um, shutdown, any user can shut down with the other normal shutdown and turn on buttons. Um, you can disable that again in group policy, but it's not officially supported in this um, interface here, they don't give you an easy shortcut. A lot of this is it just provides what it needs, and if you need to do other administrative tasks, you can do it. Now, if you're providing this for a more public environment, something like a library or a school or a business environment, I definitely go lock it down with group policy and do things like turn off um, the menus for shutting it down just to make it harder for people to screw up because people do that. The question is, does it make sense for user use case? So, it depends on your use case. So, if you look at the pricing of the program of being like $99 to add six systems, if you're running lightweight users that are doing things like web browsing and need a desktop, it's probably worth it if you need a Windows environment. Because you can get a relatively cheap system that'll run like six monitors. So if you have like a system with onboard graphics and a low-end dedicated graphics card, you can run six monitors, you plug in six keyboards and mice, you might need another USB hub or two. And compared to a traditional like office desktop, you might be adding $200 for a low-end graphics card and a couple USB hubs and the license. And for getting another five usable systems out of that, that's a pretty good value for what you get. 
Now, gaming's the other one, and gaming just brings up a lot of software issues. And I don't really know what to say and how that can be dealt with, really. Um, fun, some things like Steam just don't seem to like it, and I think if you are truly into the I want two people to game on the same system, I think going virtualization works better. There's less issues, though virtualization still has some issues with some anti-cheat software. I think definitely you want to play with this on your specific config with your programs before you deploy it. That's why they have the free trial and that's what it's nice for. So don't just, you know, deploy it for all your gamers and see if it works. I think it's definitely a make a list of games you expect to play, put them on the system, see if those games will work with multiple users at the same time, see if the performance is okay, potentially do any needed tweaking, things like that. But it's a cool little program. I wish there was more options. I wish I wish Microsoft would include their own software inside Windows to do it. Because they wrote the software and it supports it. It's just they don't flip the switch in Windows 10. If they made a Windows 10 version that supported it, I think you could get a reasonable amount of sales. Not a ton, but there's a niche market that likes it. I definitely say it's a lot easier than doing virtualization. There's a lot less to worry about. Basically any hardware should run this software, whereas with virtualization there's a lot more requirements in terms of CPU support and multiple graphics cards, you need to pass things through and stuff. And this can also be done on a traditional setup with software installed and just add a user and then turn it off easily. Virtualization, you pretty much need Linux or another OS to run as the base OS. It's kind of a pain to move your physical system to a virtual machine. It's not just install a program and click and go. So thanks for watching this little look into Aster and kind of the whole multi-point awning on Windows 10. And subscribe for more videos like this in the future.